Welcome to Out Loud, the Selective Mutism podcast. We'd like to start off today by first introducing ourselves. Chelsea, do you want to tell a little bit about yourself? Sure. My name is Chelsea Gamash. Um, I'm, I was formally diagnosed with selective mutism when I was f- five years old. Um, I no longer have that diagnosis. Um, I went on to get my bachelor's degree in psychology, and I just finished up my master's program in behavior analysis like this month. So I'm really excited to have some free time to work on a podcast. And um, she asked me to participate in her podcast, which I thought was a wonderful idea. And actually, I'm quite excited to do it. Um, So I don't really, you know, I do work as a registered nurse um, as my career, and I've been a nurse for 26 years. Um, However, that, you know, I think it probably did help a little bit in um, helping Chelsea along with her SM when she was a young child. But um, I should probably have like a disclaimer here for both Chelsea and I that, you know, the podcast is really just our experience. Um, We're not professionals. And I forgot to say, um, I am a behavior analyst um, in the making, but I don't work with kids on, who have selective mutism. I work with people on the autism spectrum. Mm-hmm. Which actually has been a great um, a great fit for you. I yeah. feel like you found your perfect job, career. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so it'll be Chelsea and I hosting the podcast, and um, yeah, we hope you enjoy it. Yes, we want to help people who are struggling with selective mutism right now, um, including parents and teachers and you know, kids themselves. Um, teens, a lot of teens out there, although... Yeah, they're underserved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just anyone, really, whose lives are touched by selective mutism. I mean can be cousins, you know, grandparents, anybody. Um, and even if you don't have somebody with SM, it's just um, just good to be aware of um, kids out there that you may just think are shy or rude or whatever, that they may actually be struggling with SM. Right. We want to educate and also be like a support system for mm-hmm. people who are dealing with selective mutism. Yeah, just to have a podcast where everybody can go, sort of share experiences, listen, learn, um, and just come together. Um, Chelsea, did you want to start off by giving us a definition of SM and just sort of clarifying what SM is sure. for people that don't yet know? Okay. So I have the official definition from the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So we're just going to talk about the official definition and then we can talk about what it actually means. So what is the DSM? (laughs) So basically the uh, DSM stands for a Diagnostic Statistical Manual. So it's like the fifth version or fifth edition, whatever you want to call it. Um, It's put out by the APA, which is the American Psychiatric Association. So it's basically a tool put out um, for psychiatrists it's basically has all the criteria in it for mental disorders, how to diagnose them, um, like a, an explanation. Um, so the DSM-5 has the most up-to-date criteria for diagnosing mental health disorders, um, along with some text and common language for clinicians, psychiatrists, um, to reference to basically diagnose their patients. Right, so the DSM is just a huge book that has all the criteria. Um, So every time they revise different disorders, you have Mm -hmm. they have to release a new one. Mm -hmm. There's five out right now. Yeah, Um, it doesn't have any like recommendations for treatment. It just um, explains what the disorder is and what the criteria are to fall under that disorder. Um, but it does, once you have the diagnosis, it can lead to the treatment that mm-hmm. you need. Yep. I think when I first graduated nursing school, which was like 26 years ago, I remember the DSM-3. And so now we're on DSM-5. Right. So it's probably, I don't know how often they update it, but just as a reference. Yep. Kind of like the Bible for mental health disorders. Right. For physicians. I don't know if that will offend anybody. <laughs> no. <laughs> so... 
The first criterion is that there's a f- consistent failure to speak in specific social situations where there's an expectation for speaking. So um, a child may speak in the home, but not in school or public settings, which is often when it's diagnosed because it becomes noticeable when the kid starts school and they aren't talking Mm -hmm. in that setting. Um, And then the second criterion is the disturbance interferes with their educational achievement or social achievement, which makes Mm -hmm. sense. That's just the the definition for a disorder. Mm -hmm. And then... It also has to last for a certain specific amount of time. So it has to last for at least one month, and that can include the first month of school. Right, because sometimes there's that initial, like, warm-up period, so that really doesn't count. Yep. Um, Yep, and I think, I don't know, at least I know with you, we always kind of suspected, I mean, something was there, but until you actually started school... Um, you know, was sort of confirmed, and that sort of led us one thing to another to actually get a diagnosis. Right. But the sooner, the better. The sooner you know, the sooner you can treat it. Mm-hmm. And then the fourth criterion is that the failure to speak is not due to a lack of language or discomfort with a language. So if somebody moved from another country where they don't speak English, they might not be comfortable speaking English. Mm-hmm. Um, so that doesn't you wouldn't be diagnosed with selective mutism if that was the case. Mm-hmm. And then the last one is it's not better accounted for by a communication disorder or some kind of um, pervasive developmental disorder. Right, or maybe a child that stutters so they don't want to speak in public because they're embarrassed about stuttering. That wouldn't Right, but you criteria. can have both, right? You can. You because actually went through a little stuttering. period of stuttering. Right. That resolved quickly. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's the official definition. Um, It's pretty rare. The statistics are a little weird. It's uh, between like 0.03 to 1% of the population. I actually think I'd like to look into that more because I wonder if the statistics, well, I'm sure they have, they've changed. Right. Because I remember when you were diagnosed, I remember the numbers were 1 in 500 one yeah. out of 500 children. I think it's a lot more common than that. Yeah, but... I recently saw something, I think it was like one out of every 100, or mm-hmm. it was a lot more prevalent. Okay, so there's a couple myths um, about selective mutism or things people just don't understand. Um, so one of them is that the child is just being stubborn and they're mm-hmm. being controlling by not talking. Yep, bad behavior. Mm-hmm. They're, they're being rude. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I do disagree with that. Um, I think <laughs> <laughs> I think kids are trying. Kids with selective mutism are trying their hardest to talk. It's uncomfortable to be the only one who's not talking. Yeah. And you really want to. I don't think it's mm-hmm. you're withholding talking to right. be controlling. But I do. I will say that I am a stubborn person. But I think the stubbornness helped me overcome right. selective mutism. Yeah, because you're always hardest on yourself. Right. And I think, too, um, you know, that even goes, I mean, this is an important topic, I think, especially just even with parents, because I think people parent differently. And it's, um, even though you know there's a diagnosis there, it's difficult for a parent knowing when to reprimand and when not to reprimand. Um, Like, when is the behavior selective mutism behavior, or when is it just bad behavior? And I know me and my husband always... um, struggled a little bit on um, agreeing, um, you know, what was, what <laughs> yeah. behaviors were attributed Wait, to the SM. We could do a whole episode on yeah. that. Yeah, we could. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we probably will. <laughs> it will be on its way. Um, so another myth is just that children who are mute or have selective mutism must have been traumatized. For, mm-hmm. That's why they're acting that way, which is not mm-hmm. true. I had no trauma in my childhood. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I do remember being asked that when right. we took you into Children's Hospital. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's not true. Um, and then people often say it's just shyness mm-hmm. and that eventually they'll get over it or outgrow it. I think a lot of times that comes from relatives because right. they're trying to say something They're trying to be nice. supportive, right? Yeah, they're trying to reassure the parent. A lot of them won't acknowledge that there is such a thing as SM that it's just shyness because that's when they grew up, that's what it was known as. Right. Or, you know, everyone knew a shy child, but nobody's really heard of selective mutism. Right. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the last myth I have is that if the child doesn't speak, it must be because they have a language delay or a speech delay, which is not necessarily true because the definition of selective mutism is that they speak um, fine in certain situations. It's just in specific settings where they right. are not speaking. And I remember, I think when you were like in preschool or something, the first time people approached me about it, they didn't believe me that you actually spoke at home nonstop, um, that it wasn't, that I had never saw it as being a problem because nobody had ever approached me about it before. So hopefully that's given you somewhat of an idea about the podcast and who we are, what our experience is, what led us to this point of having a podcast or wanting to do the podcast. Um, you know, this is our first one. We've never done a podcast before, um, but we did come up with some ideas of things we'd like to talk about on this podcast about selective mutism. Um, and it was kind of interesting because Chelsea made up her list and then I made up my list <laughs> and... Um, it was just interesting to see her ideas versus my ideas and then where they kind of overlapped and it was just interesting. We have a lot of the same topics. We do, but then some of them were interesting. Like my first one I had down was for Chelsea to talk about her feelings, what it felt like to be a child with SM. Um, so that was on my list, which I thought would be really interesting because I know as a parent, that was one of the hardest things. Just like, what is she <laughs> thinking? What is she experiencing? Yeah. You know, this, yeah. And then just basic signs of SM because there's a lot of other symptoms besides the speaking aspect of SM. Right. Um, and that was kind of the more confusing part for me as a parent, like what was really going on. Um, I also thought, you know, just, I don't know, being a nurse and then Chelsea's background, um, getting her master's, maybe devoting an episode to um, just different literature and studies that were done, case studies or whatever. Yeah like in journals and um, can review some studies like what's out there what are the professionals reading about SM and what do we think of it um, so I think I'll, you know just parenting an SM child obviously we'll cover that and um, with school just starting I think you know having some an episode maybe one of our earlier episodes yeah devoted to school teachers classroom I remember when I was a kid I had a lot of um, criticisms for teachers even though I was Mm. Like, but I couldn't express how they could help me at that point. So it would be good to talk mm. about what they can do to be supportive and promote right. progress. Yeah. I think the biggest number one thing, if I could just generalize in one sentence, I think the biggest attribute for a teacher would be to form a um, trusting relationship. Right. So I think the build biggest rapport. thing... Build rapport. Yeah, build rapport. And I think the biggest thing, we were so lucky in first grade to have Miss Kim who actually before school started came over to the house and met Chelsea and went up to her bedroom. They just spent some alone time mm -hmm. and that was uh, super important. That was great. I got off to a good start in first grade. Um, what else? Um, I, think, I think we like to go into different treatment options and the therapies that are out there mm -hmm. and how to find the right therapist for your child. Mm -hmm. And there are different philosophies out there on treating SM. Um, so we can get into that. And then there's a big debate about meds or no meds. Yeah, it's controversial. It is. It is a tough decision and it's very individual, but we can go over the pros and cons and just different experiences with that. Um, and I think... Um, you know, I, I think it, it changes too. I mean, the young child issues having SM are kind of more obvious and upfront. But I think as um, as you age and becoming a teenager, it's like a whole different set of issues. Um, right. I think it's viewed as a childhood mm -hmm. disorder too. So there's not like treatment for teens as far as I know. Yeah, but it seems... Reading online, a lot of kids have slipped through the cracks and right. not gotten treatment or haven't responded to treatment or haven't had access to treatment. Um, so there's a lot of struggling teens out there, and it breaks my heart to read online that somebody can make it to their teen years and still be struggling. Did you talk about your different diagnoses that you had as a child? No. Because they're 
you know, it's not just SM. Usually there are com- comorbid. Um, right. So we could talk a lot about anxiety. I think that's mm-hmm. always, it's just part of selective mutism. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like the driving force. Mm-hmm. And I do have um, like social, I think I was diagnosed with social phobia yeah. and generalized anxiety disorder, which I still struggle with social mm-hmm. anxiety today. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was at Boston Children's Hospital. We had taken Chelsea. So that's where she received her diagnoses. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important, too, because it even took us a while to sort of differentiate anxiety from selective mutism. Right. Um, Chelsea had actually participated uh, one summer as a teen with Brave Buddies at um, CMI, uh, Child Mind Institute in New York City. We went and stayed for a week so that she could help Dr. Kurtz uh, with the program as a volunteer. Um, And he actually said to us for the first time, um, that her SM was cured. Yeah, which was pretty shocking. Yeah, we were me. really taken aback by that. We hadn't considered that yeah. her SM was cured. No, that never occurred to me that I, just because I no longer meet the criteria, that that means I don't have select mutism anymore, even right. though I still have anxiety. And so we were kind of confusing the two. Yeah, or, yeah. I just lumped them <clears throat> together in my yeah. brain. So that was actually, we kind of argued a little bit with him initially when he said that. <laughs> we didn't really believe him. Right. But um, so that's an interesting thing to talk about. Um, and I think just to another podcast could be just how SM has affected your life. Because I think depending on the child, the longer it exists, the more you suffer socially. Um, just learning those normal social cues. and Right. And you um, miss out on things. Yeah. You miss out on a lot. Right. Yeah, you can miss out on a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's actually, we did actually end up doing some medication, and that was why, because I just felt like you were missing out on your childhood, Mm -hmm. and you wanted your childhood. So for us, that was the right decision. Anyway, there's so so much. It's like endless, endless topics that we could talk about. Um, But we do plan on having some guests on the podcast, too. We haven't reached out to anyone yet, but we've got a list of... um, (laughs) Of people that we would like to have on the podcast. Yep. Um, So we'll see, you know, we'll reach out to them and see if we can get them on. Um, You know, having the internet or whatever is a great thing. So we'll have to, uh, using Skype or whatever to enable that. Yeah, figure out how to do that. Yep. Anyway, we're sort of just figuring this whole thing out and trying to put it together. And um, Hopefully, you'll follow us along for the journey. Yeah, I promise we'll try to get better (laughs) as we go on. I hope we will get better. I hope so. (laughs) Thank you for sticking with us for our first episode of Out Loud. We hope you join us for our next episode where we'll be discussing school and all things related. Click subscribe to be notified of our future episodes and follow us on Facebook and Instagram.